Good afternoon, everyone. So we're just going to give it a couple of minutes as people are cycling in. I'm Jason Scott Embry, the Vice President for Development at Naropa. So it's so good to see all the faces. It is a warm, sunny day here in Boulder. Some rain the last night and luckily knocked some of the smoke out of the air so we can see the mountains again today or the flat irons. Give it one more minute. We'll have others join us during the presentation, so but we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, I'm Jason Scott Embry. I'm the Vice President for Development at Naropa University, and thrilled to have you all join us on a warm summer afternoon as we wrap up the month of July. And we are thrilled to have Naropa Community Counseling with Joy Redstone as the Executive Director. Welcome Dr. Deborah Bowman, who many of you all know um, from her role as a professor and, and tremendous supporter of our beloved university. I'm just thrilled to, to introduce um, Deb today. Um, I had sent a couple of emails out, um, early, one early this morning and one an hour ago with a copy of today's program, a little keepsake um, for everyone. That also includes some links that Deborah put together for us um, with her presentation on suggested readings and, and other activities, and also some additional information with regards to Naropa Community Counseling. But again, it's a tremendous pleasure for me to, to welcome Dr. Bowman and uh, greatly appreciate um, you being with us today and bringing with us um, just a great perspective of poetry and um, visual presentation um, with regards to after the hellfire and healing personal and collective trauma. So Dr. Bowman, I will turn it over to you. So she has a PowerPoint presentation, which we'll um, pull up. And uh, but before we get started, um, let's open with the traditional Naropa bow. And everyone will be muted. And um, if you have a question or um, would like to, you can put it in the chat box. A little logistics um, because of the PowerPoint presentation, there's a slide bar that you can move um, to bring people in and out in the top um, right hand corner of the screen, you can change how you view the presentation. But again, if you want to make it larger or smaller, see the Brady Bunch of all the attendees, um, those pieces. And this is also being recorded, and um, we'll be able to share this um, via um, our social media, our Facebook and YouTube pages um, in a couple of weeks once we go through a closed captioning. Um, adding that um, to the presentation. So, Deb, I will turn it over to you. Great. Thanks so much. I appreciate the um, introduction. And um, I just want to say a few things about this presentation. I'm excited to share with you all about the ideas of working with creativity in healing both collective and personal trauma. So I'll be using haiku as the major sort of art process, but you can extrapolate from that. And I'll be talking, I'm sure, to some of you who are therapists, some of you who are not, um, some of you who've been through Naropa, some of you have not. So I'm going to make it to a broad audience and then give some suggestions about how to work with this with others or with yourself as a healing tool. So let's go to the next slide. 
There we go. And how about the next one? And we might as well go to the one after this. Next slide. Okay. So here is the most common symbol that's used in a haiku, the moon. And it usually refers to enlightenment. But we will be looking at many symbols used in haiku. But I want to start first with a quote here. Next slide. There we go. This quote, haiku is both a very outward and a profoundly contemplative inner kind of art. So haiku is about looking out and seeing the universe, basically, but how it's reflected inside. And this quote, forward please, by Carl Strand, a one-time Zen monk for 12 years and a prolific haiku artist and teacher, talked about how we need to balance the inner and the outer in our lives. And this is what haiku does and what helps us do, whether we're reading haiku or writing haiku or sharing haiku. So we'll talk about this balancing throughout this presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm going to give you five basic haiku elements first, and then we're going to look at how these have healing elements for trauma. Okay, first bullet point, please. Okay, haiku is about the here and now. It's written in the present tense, and it reflects our here and now experience. Next bullet. It's very intimate. Dogen Zenji, a Zen monk and famous teacher from the 1700s, excuse me, the 1200s in Japan, talked about how we need to be intimate with all things. And intimate with all things means we can relate to them. This is how we relate in a healing way. Next bullet point. Okay, haiku is typically about nature and often represented by the seasons. And it's both about outer nature and our inner human nature. And the seasons teach us about the cycle of life. Next bullet point. Haiku is typically known as spare, very simple nothing extra, and this can be very healing. We'll talk about that in a minute. Last bullet point on this slide. In haiku, we often juxtapose two things. We bring them side by side to either compare, contrast, show how they're similar, show how they're different. And again, let's go to the next slide. Okay. We're going to talk about how each of these elements heal. Okay, first bullet point. The, whoops, it brought them all in. Well, we'll just go right down the line. So the here and now heals the there and then. And with trauma, with the horror, the terror somebody's experiencing, the way our bodies respond is it keeps taking us back to that place. We want to solve the problem. We are stuck there. So haiku has a way of bringing us out of the there and then back into the here and now. Something we often try to work and help people with in therapy, as well as our friends when we're just talking to them. The intimacy of haiku heals the isolation that is very common with trauma. And that isolation often causes shame. We're like an echo chamber. We can't get it out. It just keeps going back and forth inside. So the isolation also brings shame, which has nothing to do actually with trauma. It's usually not our fault. In fact, trauma is basically about something that is, happens to us that has nothing to do with us. 
The nature and seasons heals the stasis and static quality of trauma, where we also in a frozen place. So the seasons tell us we can move out of winter back into spring. The spareness of haiku prevents something called or heals something called perseveration. Now this is a big word for something that happens with our minds and with our art and with how we live after trauma. It's repetitive, okay? There's repetitive quality and the repetitive quality, like say with our mind, keep repeating thoughts, images, that it also proliferates and it makes it bigger. It makes it something that it's not actually what it is. So the spareness of haiku cuts that. And the juxtaposition, by bringing two things side by side, we associate them instead of dissociated them. So where we feel in trauma dissociated from the world, from others, and even from ourself and our basic senses. Haiku, part of the practice is to bring two things side by side and help them associate again. Okay, next slide, we'll start with the first poem, the first haiku. Now read it here. The short night after the hellfire, the day breaks. The short night is a summer night, it's not very long, but it's filled with hellfire. Far Mantero. In 1945, during the firebombing of Japan, his and 65,000 other people's houses were burned down. More lives were lost than in Hiroshima, Hiroshima and Nakasagi combined. He went through a trauma, a collective trauma. He wrote this poem, this is hard to believe, the day after, the day after. He had a contemplative practice of haiku writing. It was a discipline. And the haiku places last night's hellfire with the morning dawn, okay? And what he's saying is change exists. I can now be in this present moment. So you can see the healing quality here. Okay, let's do the next slide and we'll look at another poem about war trauma. The autumn wind has torn the telegram and more from mother's hands. Nicholas Regilio was writing about seeing his mother receive this telegram. She's in shock, an aspect of trauma. She can't even hold on to this little slip of paper. And he is processing his own trauma through writing about this very intimate experience with his family of pain. He is working the trauma through and it's both making him more available to his mother, because this is an act of compassion. He's viewing her with compassion. And this poem is available to people now who've had similar traumas, who know about this, and so can be healing as well. Okay, our last poem on the next slide, please about war trauma. After the rain, bomb craters filled with stars. John Brandy writes this cont contemplative experience. He's visiting Burma after his father had been there many years previously in World War II. He's seen the bomb craters, but he's seen something else because he has a contemplative mindset. He has a practice, you know, haiku is considered a way, just like Ikebana. It's considered a way of mindfulness practice. 
and he's connecting heaven and earth through this rain. Sort of the rain of heaven comes down to the earth and he sees through time that change, the seasons, the years have changed his perspective and can allow him to see beauty even where there is pain. Okay, the next set of slides, please. The next one. Okay, we're going to look at personal trauma here and something that's called human-caused trauma, which war is also, but human-caused trauma is often like the interaction of two individuals. This one, my girlfriend reveals her bruises coming out. Tia Haynes is talking about an experience that is healing for her and her friend. Very intimate, very personal very feeling. She's talking about her girlfriend coming out of the closet of trauma, coming out of the closet of shame that has no place in trauma, but keeps us isolated and alone. She's talking about a healing exchange between her and her friend. And she's offering this haiku to the community at large, so we can all understand what is healing of trauma. Beautiful. Okay. Let's look at the next slide here, the next haiku. This one is shocking. Child shows off a bulletproof backpack. No joke. No joke is a howl at the absurdity of our world, at the pain of the situation that a vulnerable child who doesn't understand their own vulnerability is kind of being cool. Look at me, I've got this, I'm this tough little kid. Well, kids aren't tough, kids are vulnerable. And Wilson is bringing out a truth in our world of the craziness of it in a way that pages of statistics could never do. And we are grateful to her for that. Okay, next slide. Okay, this one I wrote. And it was after the King Super shooting here in Boulder, where I live seven blocks away. And I know many of you who are watching this slideshow know about this deeply, intimately. And of course, anybody in the nation, anybody connected to Naropa knows about this. I was pretty numb after the shooting. We were told to lock our doors immediately. We got emails, texts. And a couple days later, decide to take some lilies down to the fence. And I'm still feeling numb and I'm thinking, why am I doing this? You know, what's this about? But I felt compelled. And the lilies I took down, I had bought three days earlier at King Supers. Taking them out of the plastic, putting them in the fence with the other notes and flowers and poems and images. And there's a breeze. And these lily anthers, the, the anthers inside the flowers, start to just shake like this, just tremble. And realize, oh, it woke me up. In that moment, it woke me up. I needed to tremble. I needed to be like nature. Our community was trembling in fear, in pain, in shock. We needed to come out of shock and begin to move. This is life. It's sort of like the lily anthers and the wind are sandwiching the shooting in this haiku. So we can learn to live again. Okay, I'm gonna move now in the next slide to a series of three haiku by a woman named Janice Bostock. She's Australian and she was considered sort of the mother of the haiku movement in Australia, uh, a very prolific and active woman. Um, 
who haiku was a way for her to be seen and heard. Uh, she was somebody who experienced quite a lot of bullying as a child. This poem here, the beginning of this trilogy of poems, pregnant again, the fluttering of moths against the window. So we're getting this sense of life coming. And this is fluttering. This is not trembling. This is the flutter of a moth, soft. And it's against the window. It's like, can she let this feeling in? Can she let in this feeling again after being pregnant once? So soft, so beautiful. Let's move to her second poem in the next slide. Venus kicks the sky to the east, brilliant. So moths come in the spring. Her pregnancy begins in the spring. Now it's summer or fall. The sky to the east, this new day is dawning. Brilliant. And she's being kicked with life. It's like, wow, isn't this amazing? I'm letting this in. I'm letting this in. Okay. So spare, so simple. So you can guess this next slide is going to be sad, her next haiku. Tiny coffin, the long winter passing. So tiny and so huge, the feeling. She doesn't have to say a feeling, it's there. This is a commemoration, this is a memorial to this child whose name she either can't say or she hasn't named. But her presentation gives this poem to all of us, anyone who's been through this experience. And she's using haiku to work with her feelings through the long winter. Very long for her. And we see her tremendous bravery and courage to bring this forward, to make this process public. So many parents hide because they're scared. And her bravery helps others to know you can come out and share too and be healed. Okay. Ah, let's take a little breather and move to the next slide. We're going to look at five more concepts to understand haiku and then look at how these concepts can be healing as well. So let's go to the first bullet point. Okay. Chasse means sketch from nature. It's just a simple sketch. It's a picture. The next bullet. A haiga, that's a haiku plus a visual sketch. And I've been giving you modern haiga by putting an image behind these haiku. And the idea is to bring out more of the feeling tone of the haiku. Next bullet. Makati. Haiku must have a sincere feeling. This is something I learned from the writing of Carl Strand, which we mentioned earlier. Must have a sincere feeling. Next bullet, please. Sabi, you might have heard this term, or wabi-sabi, usually refers to sad beauty, like, like an incredible piece of music played at a memorial, and that is often what haiku does. The next bullet, last one. And yugen, haiku often contains some reference to the unknowable or the mystery. We saw that in John Brandy's poem with the, with the stars reflected in the craters, in, in the water in the craters. It has us touch something that is mysterious. And also 
transpersonal, meaning beyond the person. So let's look at how these concepts, what they have to offer in the next slide. Okay, the first bullet. Please, yeah. Okay, oh, we're gonna get them all together, great. Okay, so this sketch is a mind picture and the evolution of how we use our mind is we thought in pictures long before we thought in words. A lot of animals think in pictures. So it's much deeper in the brainstem, in, in the brain, the experience. And so it's much more evocative, therefore much more potent and healing. And the haiga offers a nonverbal approach. Like if we're writing or looking, it helps us even go deeper. Mataki, this feeling, offers truth, opportunity for us to speak our truth, to hear truth when we read haiku and share it. And of course, sabi, the sad beauty, offers us the transformation of pain. And yugen gives us humility. We are a small, tiny piece of the universe. We don't understand how healing really works. We have little snippets. We don't really understand the healing nature of time, but it helps us understand we're a small bit, and this can be healing as well. Let's go to the next slide. We're going to start on the next slide with a series of four haiku written about the environmental trauma, the disaster that happened in Australia just last year with the fires. These haiku were actually written in 2009 when they had the first terrible, awful fires that they understood as climate um, change related. Um, but some of the pictures I will share with this are from the recent fires. So this first one, silhouette, helicopter blades, chop, the blood red sun. Quite a sketch, eh? quite a sketch of pain of that immediate experience. And sometimes we need to share that pain, that immediate experience that was indelible, makes an indelible mark inside that can, the indelibility of it can be a cause of trauma, but also needs to be healed. So next slide, please. Okay, distant fires. Family search under a blue moon. So these distant fires now have, it's cooled down, but families are now searching for mementos, for memories, for their homes. It's almost like we need to see what happened. And this poem talks about the sadness, the sabi of this experience. Okay, next slide. Water, the word means everything now. This poem does not juxtapose against something, but it's implied as a part. The Australian haiku community came together and wrote these haiku and then offered them to the community. So it's very simple and very direct. And my haiga that I added to this offers the juxtaposition and the bird to me represents all of life that depends on this stark landscape now that must be healed. Next slide. And here's the final one of the sequence. Deep ash, memories laid down for generations to come. Trauma can be intergenerational and our art can be passed down People say, oh, yes, I was part of that. Oh, yes, this is why I'm still feeling the losses that occurred from my family. This is still something reverberating. It helps me understand that I'm part of something larger and a longer term healing process. Okay, we're going to go to the next slide. And we're going to talk about prison trauma. Some of the are very obvious. In the prison graveyard, just as he was in life, convict, 
14302. We don't have to say a feeling to feel this, do we? Johnny Baranski was a political activist. He ended up spending two years in jail for his political activism. And he wrote this in jail about what he experienced and bringing it out, he is still being an activist again. We hear a poem that's much more powerful than a news report or a long article. Next slide, please. Okay, this is by Basho, the mother father of haiku, written in the end of the 1600s. Raging seas lying over Sado Island, the Milky Way. Then political commentary was hidden. Sado Island was where the prisoners were kept in Japan at this time. And I think Basha was saying, how can the world hold so much beauty and so much pain? The raging seas, and again, we have the Milky Way as this heaven overlooking this very painful earth. Next slide, please. Okay, and this poem by Kayutero is what's called a death poem, a tradition in haiku and Japan. Tender winds above the snow melt many kinds of suffering. You feel the tenderness, you feel the softness. Kayutero was also a political activist. In the 1920s, um, he uh, was an activist for labor when labor was beaten and killed and he committed a crime himself. He shot a general kind of in retaliation for so many of his comrades who had been shot mercilessly. And he's been in jail for six years when he wrote this poem, Ill in Northern Japan, cold, suffering. And he wrote this before committing suicide. He gave us a gift. He gave us a gift that 20, let's see, 1920, 100 years later, we feel the self-compassion. We feel his softening and the gift he offers us through his beautiful, beautiful haiku. Okay, next slide. Okay, these are our last three slides. These is a collection of poems by Sonia Sanchez, a Black American haiku artist and poet. Um, she, I think she's in her late 80s now, and she is a poet in residence at Temple University. Derelict with the eyes, I settle in a way, in a quiet carnival of waves. This poem is about meeting the eyes of someone labeled a derelict. And she's experienced an aliveness, a human encounter, an I thou experience that she shares with us. So powerful, so beautiful. Next slide. This, if you can read in the top, is a poem by Sanchez dedicated to Fanny Lou Hamer. And this is my haiga is an image of her. You can feel her, it's a direct experience. This beautiful woman and the haiku, feet deep in cotton, you shifted the country's eyes. Feet deep, this woman is grounded, she's of the earth. And she grew up picking cotton, poor, used. She became an activist for voters' rights. In the 60s, when she tried to vote, she was beaten to near death and suffered permanent disabilities from that. She went on to speak up. She testified before Congress about her experience and why she knew she had a right to vote. She was grounded in her rights, in her reality. And standing, she shifted the country's eyes. So we're going to 
end this series of haiku by going to the next slide. Her last, well, not her last poem, but the last poem of hers that we're going to share, Humming This Earth Back to Sanity. Humming This Earth Back to Sanity. She's giving us a prescription for healing. And in the Black American spiritual tradition, humming was something the congregation did to join the pastor in the prayers, in the service, to feel deeply, to come together, to heal. It's like a hum. All across traditions, this kind of music has been healing. And she's saying, this is what we need to do to heal ourselves. OK, next slide. OK, how to heal with haiku. First bullet, we need to contemplate it. We just simply need to read and sit with it. Or we need to read and appreciate. We just need to sit in nature and allow the haiku to come to us if we want to write. Next bullet. Next bullet, please. Yeah, we need to feel. We need to feel deeply. And we need to learn about others. We can do that through reading haiku. Or writing haiku. Next bullet. We will discover so much about ourselves and others and about healing. Next bullet. We can appreciate, we can appreciate ourselves and the others through this process. And our last bullet. Okay. And sharing. Sharing is a way to heal. I've shared haiku with clients that I felt might fit their experience. Hey, does this fit? Yes or no. We can share it with our friends and we can do that with non-judgment. Okay, we're going to end here because I'm getting little messages that our time is up and we need to move on. Um, let's do the next slide quickly. Next bullet. The debt we owe to the play of the imagination is incalculable by Carl Jung. Next bullet. And here we go. Playing is itself a therapy. Now, some of this is serious play, but it's play. And this quote in the next bullet by D.W. Winnicott, a famous child psychologist, talking about how the creative process is healing itself. OK, last slide. We have a whole series that's in part of your packet. I recommend all these resources. So check them out. Thanks so much. Um, it must be time for questions. Thanks for your patience. Thank you so much, Deb, for an absolutely wonderful, beautiful, and, and thoughtful presentation. We do have a, a few minutes for, for questions um, asked. If you had a question to put it in the, in the chat bar, I'm not seeing any, or if you want to raise your hand, you can unmute. This, um, one of the challenges of the Brady Bunch is flipping through all the different screens to see if anyone has it. We all have Buddy unshare the slide presentation for a minute. Katie, you have a question. Thank you so much, Deb. I, um, I've i always felt so drawn to haiku and have not, and now I understand why. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. And I was just wondering <clears throat> personally, what, what got you, what brought you into the world of haiku? Like what, what was the moment where you discovered haiku? Well, I actually can't point to a moment, but I used to teach a canoe course for um, Naropa uh, where we often wrote poems. And I see Carol Griever there. She was one of the people that helped me teach poetry on these haiku, 
on these river trips because it's about nature and it's about sinking in to that contemplative experience. And um, yeah, so that's where I started. And haiku, just being in nature has been very healing for me. And the haiku helped bring it home and helped me bring it in on a much deeper level. Yeah. And being a therapist and teaching at Naropa, we used haiku when I worked for the Wilderness Therapy Program, our poetry as a way to help people process feelings and thoughts and wounds. So I got to, for nine years with that program, teach about using it therapeutically as well. And so that's how I kind of started putting the trauma and the haiku piece together. Yeah. So Deb, Great question. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Barbara Lee has a question and she asked, she said, is this a model that is used in therapy and is there a book you would recommend for this model in working with clients? Okay, here's a book by John Fox called Poetic Medicine. Highly recommend it. It's on your list. And it talks about how specifically to use it in therapy. So he has, some, he has a few examples of haiku in there. But often when I work with poetry with people early, I don't limit it to any one medium of poetry. Yeah. And some of the other books I recommend um, can help you like just start learning about haiku. This Haiku Mind is brilliant by Patricia Donegan. She, she offers a poem and then she writes about the poem. So it gives us a feel for that. Um, working with death with individuals, Japanese death poems I highly recommend. Um, and on and on. Yeah, there's lots out there that's available. Thanks again, Deb. And I put in the chat bar, we'll be um, after um, the next series of presentations for the next um, 12 minutes, um, we're gonna stick around for a few minutes if you have any additional questions and wanna speak directly with both Deb and, and Joy Redstone. Great, all right. Thanks again, Deb, just an absolute blessing. And um, now I have a totally different perspective from your other book, <laughs> The Female Buddha. And just seeing the quotes that you use there and the pictures and just the beauty of the juxtaposition of both prose and, and the visual piece. So, so oh. thank you again. Oh, you're more than welcome. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And we wanted to take an opportunity to share a little bit more about Naropa Community Counseling. A number um, of you um, on the call have had a chance to participate directly with Naropa Community Counseling and being their center and, um, and others such as myself um, have not had the opportunity to, to visit. And so Joy Redstone has prepared a video tour of Naropa Community Counseling and we will um, have that video um, teed up here shortly. And then um, immediately after Joy, we have two students to give just a brief perspective of their great work as interns in Naropa Community Counseling. So we'll have a brief tour of the facility. Hi, this is your personalized tour of Naropa Community Counseling. So as we enter here, we're coming into the weight room. The goal here is to have our space be welcoming, warm, comfortable, informational. And a place that reflects people's uniqueness. As we come into the clinic um, on the swipe board, we post inspirational uh, sayings and the groups that are ongoing. I'll walk you through some of the therapy rooms. This is our art therapy room. Well stocked with tons of art supplies. This area is where the interns work. Now it's a pretty small area. This area, sometimes we've had up to 15 interns. So 
So you can imagine, um, just even with the belongings, that gets pretty tight. As we walk through here, here is an office that is both our administrative office and the office that the clinical supervisors meet their folks and a therapy room. So I'll show you some of the other therapy rooms. Here's our smallest therapy room. All the rooms are decorated with original art. A lot of the art comes from Deb Bowman's basement and also my basement. I'm the clinical director, Joy Redstone. Here is another therapy room. Plants, art, meditation cushions, all different kinds of ways that we can think of to make people comfortable. Additional therapy room here. And just a few more spaces. This is our group room. As you can see, it's not the largest. We also use this room to store our sand tray. And we use this room to store our massage table because we have a Reiki volunteer. And last but not least, this is our final therapy room. unmute myself. So thanks, Joy, for that brief tour of the facility. For those who haven't uh, had a chance to give you a little geographic reference, so the Boulder shooting at King Supers, um, that King Supers happens to be right across the street from Naropa Community Counseling. Uh, a little additional plug, um, Joy was interviewed by Nine News, um, the Denver NBC channel, um, shortly thereafter, um, Naropa Community Counseling did a huge pivot to help the Boulder Valley community and, and others um, in the healing process following the shooting. So again, uh, um, you can Google that information. We can also provide that um, separately or just simply visit the Naropa Community Counseling website um, on Naropa University's webpage. We also have that featured there. So now we have two student reflections. Um, the first reflection is a somatic um, student, um, an intern, Janelle Thurston. So we'll have um, Janelle's brief video teed up. Hi everyone, I'm Janelle. I'm a current intern at Naropa Community Counseling Center and an intern at Naropa in the Somatic Psychotherapy Program. I'm currently in internship, I'm seeing about 14 clients and navigating the world of Medicaid and billing as well as working with Theranest to do note taking and intakes and learning about diagnosis and treatment planning as well. So all these really foundational aspects that are so important and valuable for the therapeutic field. I'm really getting a lot of practice in and really excited to continue that throughout the year. Um, my program at Naropa, the somatic program, has really su supplemented and supported um, this transition into internship. Um, not only developing self-awareness skills and developing more mindfulness around my own thoughts and feelings and sensations, but um, really helping me develop self-trust and not only through my own practice and kind of just like getting to know that in the moment with clients and with myself, but also that's been reflected back to me through my professors and my supervisors currently at internship. Um, there's kind of this confidence and this trust instilled and put towards myself and other interns, um, this kind of sense of like going forth and becoming a budding therapist that I really appreciate and value. Um, that's really helped me along the way. Um, another aspect is just this piece of critical thinking with the contemplative approach that um, helps me struggle with, wrestle with my own values and biases and helps me to really sit across from other people and continue to inquire about others and their experience. 
overall, I'm just really happy to be here and excited to continue learning. Have a great day. Thanks, Chanel. And our next student reflection is from August Perez. And she is a contemplative um, specialization um, with her intern therapy program, again with Maroka Community Counseling. My name is August Perez, and I am a 2018 graduate from the Contemplative Psychotherapy and Buddhist Psychology Program, also known as the CPBP Program, at Naropa University. I feel so honored to be here and to get to share some of my experience with you of what it was like to go through this program and how it's still impacting my life. This program is not easy. It asks a lot of its students, and the transformation that happens is absolutely profound. And I can say with complete confidence that the CPBP program changed my life both personally and it has launched me professionally in ways that I had not even envisioned when I first began this journey. The first big thing is getting to start my own practice as well as getting to come back to the place that I interned here at the Naropa Community Counseling Center I feel so fortunate that I have had a vast array of people that I've been able to work with going through all different, different experiences in life. I'm also really excited about a new venture that I am leaning into around going back to school and going for a PhD in counselor education and supervision so that I can eventually come back to Naropa and apply to teach. Um, I believe in this program so profoundly that I would be so honored to be a part of this lineage and to ensure that it continues on to the next generation of therapists. I think that this is the best training that you can get. And if I can be a part of it, I absolutely will. So thank you so much for this opportunity, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your evening. Great, thank you so much, August. And to give a perspective of being an intern and then starting her own practice and now giving a great perspective of what's the next chapter in, in her life. This, um, these opportunities are made possible through an incredible investment from our, our donors and the Boulder community and, and many others uh, connected with the university. This past year alone, the interns in Europa Community Counseling have provided 178,000 hours of service to those most in need in, in the Boulder Valley community. And we're looking at new opportunities to, to continue to grow the program and grow our footprint into new communities along Front Range, Colorado. And to close our time together um, this evening, um, we have some final remarks from Joy Redstone, the Director of the Rep Community Counseling. Hi. My name is Joy Redstone, and I work at Naropa Community Counseling as the clinical director. I've been there five years, and it was my privilege to be there from the very beginning. And it's kind of exciting um, to be talking to you today and telling you about the needs we have because it means that we've grown a lot and are serving a lot of folks in the community. In my last job before Naropa, uh, I ran a day shelter and did a lot of fundraising. And one of the things I took away from that is the mo one of the most valuable things to hear is what your money would be used for. So we've got three things that we would love to have your support with, and I'm just going to briefly describe what they are. One is a therapeutic support fund. Essentially, we need things like art supplies, clinical books for interns, and therapeutic games, somatic aids for the therapy rooms. And those things are really expensive and the budgetary constraints of the last several years have made it difficult to meet those needs, which seem really important for both our clients and our interns. 
The second thing is called the Client Access Fund. And that's a fund specifically for people that have been involved in therapy who are at risk of dropping out because um, they don't have enough money to finish their therapy. So essentially, these are people that have already demonstrated a lot of commitment to their work, have been showing up, have been paying every week, and let's just say they lost their job or they had a financial setback and they, um, even the $30 a week can be really hard for people sometimes. So $30 covers a session and so even, you know, $90 um, is often all we really need to help people in this way. And thirdly is our um, scholarship fund for interns. Interns don't get paid for their work as you're probably aware and I'm telling you they work really hard it's a good 20 hours a week and it is about service to the community and service to others and very frequently we run into situations where interns are having a hard time paying their rent or even groceries or they run into medical bills and the idea here is just to have a fund that we were able to assist people to make uh, internship um, more supported and less stressful for them to be able to finish. Any amount that you could give would be deeply appreciated. Very happy to meet with you and discuss at length any of these initiatives that you're interested in. And I can most definitely tell you that your contribution will make a huge difference to our interns, our staff, and our clients. Thanks. Thanks so much, Joy, for your remarks. In the chat box, I just put a, a quick link and hope that you'll consider a, a gift that you're most comfortable giving. Um, each and every dollar makes a tremendous impact um, on our students, on our community, and again, helping those most in, in need. And again, we'll be, so Deb and Joy will be available um, after our um, presentation. We greatly appreciate everyone spending an hour with us this afternoon and wish you well, um, wish you continued safety um, as we um, near, um, hopefully, the end of this pandemic. Just a little, um, so Naropa University as a whole, um, as of today, um, will be um, in person in the fall. Um, which we're really excited about because just the importance of um, togetherness and um, being um, one in the beloved Naropa community. So again, thank you for joining us and we greatly appreciate all that you do for our beloved university and have a wonderful rest of your afternoon and your evening. Um, some um, it's well into the evening or morning hours um, for a few of those who have um, logged in. And again, this will be recorded. Um, and then um, the information provided by Deb is in the program that was emailed out earlier. So we will close um, with an Europa bow. And again, be well, be safe. And have a great evening.